how it works. Good. Okay, so, yes, I will just start my stopwatch such that we can drink coffee on time. Uh, hello, welcome. And I guess you can already guess where we are, and you can, some of you can guess who this guy is. And the guy, is, his name was Heraclitus, and what he said is that no man can enter the river twice, the, the same river twice. And during this talk, I will tell you that, yeah, while this is true, sometimes you can enter for the second or for the first time almost the same river. And since we are talking about the river, uh, let's use a sailboat, and there is somebody sitting on the sailboat there. And let's treat Einstein as a qubit in our quantum simulator, which we have to control somehow. And naturally, the life is a little bit cruel because we have to interact with stuff. And in principle, for this talk, what will be important is low frequency noise. But if we have low frequency noise, then we can do a little bit of measurements and maybe perform something like sail or perform coherent operations. Which brings me very nicely to my talk. And the talk will be indeed about reinforcement learning, aiding Bayesian estimation, and at the end of the day, we will see a qubit that is coherently rotating around, just something we don't control. Uh, my name is Jan Andrzej Krzywda. I came from the Netherlands, from, from Leiden, uh, where I'm a postdoc in Evers Group. Evers had a great talk a few hours ago. Um, there are also PhD students from our group, somewhere around the audience, uh, but don't worry, uh, there will be uh, pictures of them there. Uh, about me coming here from the Netherlands, also, ironically, I almost didn't get here because of the low frequency fluctuations of velocity in air called wind. Good. Uh, yeah, so I'm a part of Aqua as well, and my task in Aqua is just to understand hardware limitation and basically turn the bugs into a features. Feature, in fact. Good. So, in particular, this, not, this talk will be about spin qubits. So just to make sure we are on the same side, on the same side, I will just uh, share with you all of my knowledge about spin qubits in three minutes. So, uh, well, in order to understand spin qubits and why they are relevant, first of all, I have to do this a little bit of explanation. Uh, spin qubits are at their infancy, namely we are working on two qubit gates. This is all we can have. Maybe some people have six, 16 qubits, but this is a very preliminary work and then understand what is the spin qubit, well, you, you will have to walk a little bit in Leiden. This is in Leiden. We are looking at the wall of one of the buildings, and this should commensurate the master thesis of George Ullenbeck, who basically postulated that electrons has a spin. Uh, he, he, the thesis was all about it, and the spin can be there are two types of electrons, spin up and spin down, uh, so naturally, Whenever there is magnetic field, the two energy, the, the two levels of the electron splits and splits by omega. So this is a nice qubit addressable with energy splitting omega. The problem is uh, that if there is any source of random magnetic uh, field, there is also a noise, delta omega, and this will be a crucial actor in my talk. Uh, and in fact, you can also model this delta omega, so how, how those nuclear spins, because this is usually the source of, new, of, of magnetic noise, how they are evolving in time. They are doing diffuse, diffusion evolution, so something like a random walk. And basically this is another wall from the Netherlands, but this time we walk from Leiden to Utrecht. And in Utrecht you can find a prescription, how to simulate something which we are calling orstein ullenbeck process, uh, also known as the brown noise. Okay, but to be honest, we don't really have to bother that much about the brown, brown noise or the einstein ullenbeck process because we know so, so, so chemistry people and they have a way of getting rid of those nuclear spins and basically replacing them by something spinless. And if we do so, we have again very nice, healthy spin qubit. The problem is the moment we try to control it with elec electric film this time, we are unfortunately getting this random field again. Delta omega this time is a charge noise, a little bit different noise, but again, temporally fluctuating spin splitting. Uh, so altogether, there is a message. So, so some, somehow the control and the, the coherence of the qubit, they are interconnected with each other. 
Okay, well, the idea, why not use the noise to control the qubits? Yeah, this is a little bit provocative question, but I will try to do exactly that. Uh, okay, and having said that, there is a, another uh, part when I'm showing off what I know, and I know everything about the stochastic process, which I will tell you in five minutes. So, um, well, first of all, whenever someone says noise, you usually think of the white noise, so like vacuum cleaner, or like a fan doing so like a noise that is uncorrelated in time, and uh, this is why the spectrum is flat. And the same noise, like uncorrelated in time, is used in many approaches to modeling open quantum systems, which are called Markovian, because they are uncorrelated in time. Quantum optimal control, uh, quantum error correction usually assumes the old one, uh, uncorrelated noise or quantum error mitigation. Good, so what, why I have a problem with that? Uh, well, because in this approach we are treating quantum device as a static old TV, and so it's doing shh, and the agent just can come and interact with the quantum computer and like get some experience. Uh, he can do it again, so second experience and like the third one. And all together, all of those features are different and not uncorrelated. You can, for example, shuffle them around and nothing will change and you can do millions of interaction and at the end of the day, figure out some effective model of your noise. But it doesn't, this, this model doesn't really care in which order you interacted with your system. And if you do this, you have something which we are call, calling Gorini, Kosakowski, Lindblad, Schroeder, Schoenmaster equation, which is used in many, many uh, literature. Good. Uh, okay, so we are at this time. And obviously this is not all the processes that are happening uh, in, in, in the nature. For example, okay, this was one citation which I forgot to mention. Uh, I read a little bit about the quantum optimal control and in one of the papers I just learned that the specific question, so there are open challenges, and the specific question to what extent all of the noise that is not Markovian, so not uncorrelated temporally, uh, to what extent the optimal control can be reached in all the non-Markovian system, it's still an open challenge. And in some sense, we will attack this open challenge now. So sorry for this. But again, so what are other sources of noise? And what other sources of noise you can meet in nature? So one of them is the pink noise, so one over F noise. And you can hear it, for example, in the Netherlands very often uh, when it's raining outside. So you can just listen to the sound. Pink noise has this feature that it has low amplitude in high frequency and high amplitude in low frequency, so it's generally slow. And example relevant for me is a charge noise. Also, we have a brown noise, and you also can hear it in the Netherlands a bit when it's heavily raining, like yesterday. Uh, and it's even more low frequency noise, and the relative amplitude and high frequency is even lower. And this, again, is related to magnetic noise. So as you can see, spin qubits are rich in different colors noise. Uh, but th the difference between them is even more striking when you look at the trajectories. White noise is really, there is no structure whatsoever. Pink noise has a little bit of trend, and brown noise is really like a very slow variation of something. For a pink noise, so for a charge noise, very recently people have been trying to counterattack and basically to correct for the very slow drift you see there. So there is the, so you see the drift and people have been trying to correct for this drift, but I would like to highlight the time scale on the x-axis. It's like almost you can call this experiment calibration. I will call it calibration. Why I'm calling calibration? Well, because my friends and our friends are a little bit better, so the scale is different here, and this is the exp experiment our friends in Copenhagen uh, done, uh, and we track down this time a brown noise with much higher resolution, and maybe it gives us opportunity to react. So this was the old publication, and yesterday we just shared some improved version of it. Good, so let's say we have this trajectory. What can we do with it? Uh, obviously, there are more or less, we can collect a single shot every 50 microseconds, uh, and, and as you can see, on this time scale, the field is barely changing, so why not Forget about 
this field changing during single evolution of the, of the experiment, just update before consecutive algorithms, single shots, and this is called quasi-static approximation. And because uh, we have a lot of those single shots, we can just sacrifice some of them to learn about the noise. This would be the red dots, and in green one, we can do something. For example, your favorite quantum algorithm. Another strategy would be to bunch it a little bit, so like spend 10 shots on estimation and 20 shots to run algorithm, or basically pick your poison. Mm, and one, one caveat. Uh, those, indeed the green ones are any algorithm you want, like quantum algorithm you would like to perform. Uh, this would be the operation of our quantum device, let's say. But the red ones are the ones which are estimation algorithms. So it should be simple algorithm, such simple algorithm that we can uh, calculate probability of given correct uh, answer and basically infer in Bayesian way what is the value of the parameter. So this red one should be simple, green one, uh, you call, you name it. Okay, so the time has come to show you rotate a uh, qubit that is being rotated and it will be rotating in the gallium arsenide spin qubit that this is less relevant. We concentrated on single triplet qubit, so basically there is a way of turning two electrons into one qubit. If you are, uh, yeah, it's basically if you have two dots, and there's a, lot, a little bit of exchange interaction. And in fact, this is the effective Hamiltonian of the system. We have a knob, control knob, and we have this completely random noise, which we are not controlling, the average is zero. And because we have this no control knob, we will turn it to zero now. Yes, <laughs> so basically now we have just the Hamiltonian, which is completely stochastic. It's, it's like it has a term which has zero average, and this is why I sometimes call it quantum glider, because it doesn't have an engine. It's just, that's its thing. Uh, and in this particular example, basically the estimation and coherent rotation will be the same experiment, but in, in, yes, you will see the difference soon. So let's start with coherent rotation around the x-axis by theta. It's rather simple. Uh, yes, I have, a, I have a gadget somewhere. I should, I should have it with me. So, We are starting, there is a way of initializing along the North Pole, let's say, okay, perfect. And now we are going to let it evolve for time t, and this is a very nice control, right? We have a Hamiltonian, and we are just waiting some time for the qubit to rotate. Uh, you can think of this time as a, okay, of the whole experiment, as an estimation of the bias of a coin, and this tau is more or less the strength, or like the, the how, how, how high the coin goes. Uh, and of course, if the time is just too long, then I don't know anything, or like too small in this case. So basically, this is like the strength of my toss. And uh, in principle, if I'm not sure about this delta omega, so at the evolution generator, or like the rotation generator, then from one realization to another, I might make mistakes in the estimation, and those, so those errors in estimations are being directly translated to something which I'm calling gate infidelity. And now, you can average, sorry, you can average over all possible realizations of your errors, and by doing it, you quickly realize that the gate infidelity is proportional to your uncertainty, so the width of the prior distribution of your knowledge of the system, and yes, so it's like proportional to uncertainty. So the task would be to decrease this uncertainty in such a way. So kind of extract knowledge from the system and be more certain that the value of the field is given by something, by a constant. And in order to do it, we just need to use Bayesian estimation. This is why you see a train going through uh, OK. Uh, okay, so we do Bayesian estimation with exactly the same, uh, with, with more or less the same algorithm, so you rotate, but this time, uh, yes, you just rotate. The thing is, the algorithm is so easy that we can very easily find the probability of measuring zero and one as a function of the delta omega and the time we pick, good. Uh, so we can invert the probabilities and update our knowledge. Uh, and, and now the task would be to pick the best tau. So how long 
this age, how long we have to wait for the qubit to rotate such that our knowledge about the uncer about uncertain parameter is, is kind of getting, the knowledge is improved in the optimal way. And again, here, we have this notion of kind of waiting too long because if we wait too long, the in initial probability distribution might become multimodal and we basically, we are losing a little bit of Gaussian structure of the prior, so the posterior is, is kind of, if it is very complex and this would be another equivalent of doing it just too strongly. And finally, once we pick tau, we just measure and depending whether we got plus or minus, we have new posterior distribution which ca can be fed up back to, uh, to and, and treated as a prior for the next estimation. Perfect, so we did it. This is the experiment. I will quickly go through it. This is done in collaboration with, uh, with QDEV, so with Copenhagen, and those are two PhD students working on this uh, subject. They're in black because they are PhD students, so they, they did that hard work and I was just helping. Uh, so this is the experimental data. What they did, they just rotate the qubit by tau, so constant increments. This is the x-axis. Black ones are uh, ones and, and, and white ones are zero. You, you clearly see, for example, here that for some time the frequency of those oscillations was faster and then it was relatively constant. And because it happens and the frequency was a little bit changing while collecting the data, if you average them, you have a decay and we call it in homogeneous broadening or like Tito star like decay, doesn't matter. But we were, we were clever, so what we did, we just used each of those row to estimate the frequency. So this is how the frequency was evolving in this experiment. And after each row, so we just take the row, estimate it and use this estimation to perform coherent oscillation. So basically peak, so once we know what is the omega, we can now wait certain amount of nanoseconds such that the qubit rotates by given angle. And in this way, from very bad oscillations, we got almost stable oscillations, especially here they are stable. Uh, initial decay comes from outliers, so some kind of bad gases. And for some reason, this guy is here. You can think about it. It's, it's a little bit like Maxwell Demon, right? So we are kind of looking at the random particles and opening and closing the gaps between the two S systems. Perfect. And we are getting better at it. So this is our new edition uh, yesterday on archive. So now we are physically, so we know what is the model of the noise. So you can propagate and propagate the distribution while we are not estimating. So we have a better way of kind of using the previous posterior as an X prior. Uh, we also can, we are now adaptive. So the evolution time is basically inversely proportional to uncertainty. This is based on some NG centers experiment. Uh, and this trajectory, it's, it, it's basically is generated by using only 10 shots for estimation, which is, which is really, really nice in my opinion. And finally, Jacob in separate paper with our help, me and Avert, he thought about limiting memory of the whole thing. And memory can be limited by saying we work only with Gaussians. So it's enough to update the average of our knowledge and uncertainty. And yes, so there are now few things we can investigate. So first of all, how many of those things we can do online? Maybe some learning, maybe some agencies would be the rest of the talk. But also there are separate topics which we are trying to investigate within the aqua, so with Felix, one of our PhD students, we are thinking about using econophysics method to maybe propagate the distribution while we are not waiting. So you know, learn what will be the future distribution of the process just by looking at the trajectory. This is Dow Jones. Uh, also with Ilse, we just started to, to think about speeding up the readout by doing a little bit of classification and maybe using even not discrete outcome but continuous outcome. Uh, but for the rest of the talk, which is supposed to be like a 10 minutes, I think so. Where is my, yes. I will concentrate on this part. Okay, so now let's define a game uh, and define some kind of heuristics. So what, what is the game and how it should be played? First of all, why I would like to phrase it as a game? Why? Because in the literature, 
people have been already thinking about using reinforcement learning to improve initialization in this case. And the key element was, was field programmable gate array, so like a thing which you can program and put on top of your qubit and it's doing a little bit of logic for you. And they, did, they use it for initialization, they put it inside the reinforcement learning loop and the agent was either terminating initialization, flipping the qubit or like doing nothing. Um, so it improved initialization, but it was based on this Markovian approach. So kind of w w one uh, step was independent of another step, vaguely speaking. But our game is different. We have this slowly varying environment to which we can adjust. So we will define actions as uh, do an algorithm. In, in this simple case, this camp which I'm showing now, it will be a spin flip. So whenever there's a green dot, we are trying to flip the spin from, uh, from the North Pole to the South Pole, or the red one is just estimate. And for the time being, as a heuristic, I will use this NV center motivated waiting time, which is inversely proportional to uncertainty. Okay, so now results. Uh, first of all, I will present results on this plot. It has two axes, both axes are bad. So going vertically up, our algorithm is getting worse. So more time we are trying to flip while we are not flipping. So we, as we go up and going, sorry, going right, we are wasting more bits for estimation. Also don't, don't do it too much. Like we would like to flip a, a spin from time to time. So in the ideally we would like to be there. Uh, the stupidest strategy of all would be to always flip. For, it would be to always, but there's also probably somewhere there was a parameters are used. They, they, are fi they, they, they are trying to mimic this nuclear spins in silicon, more or less. Okay, so this is always flip strategy. It's like a reference. This, you should think of it as a limit of infidelity of zero estimation probability, so if we always flip. Mm, okay, and there are two strategy which we thought of. One is periodic, so just estimate every n. A shot or probabilistic. You just estimate with probability PE. And something happens here. I guess this is because periodic needs to have discrete steps, so uh, sometimes it just doesn't work that much, but probabilistic is a good estimation, a good heuristic to beat, and my question is, can we get there by doing something? You know what? We will bring the agent to the game and try to uh, learn this guy to play the game. So this is simple setup. This is why I left only three minutes to do so. So we will, we will bring the agent and try to, uh, and, and feed him with the observation of the mu and sigma. And the actions would be either to run the algorithm or estimate the, the field. Uh, and we will give a reward every time it successfully flip or penalize it so with negative, penal so with negative reward if the spin stays as it is. And, uh, and of course, if he is estimating, then we are updating the knowledge as I was describing. So this is the result, what agent is doing in the case when he's not controlling time. So he's only deciding, let's flip, let's estimate, but if it estimates, it's using this heuristic, what time to use. And you clearly see that as we are increasing the penalty for, uh, for bad flip or no flip, and the agent is slowly going towards more wasted bits, so higher estimation probability, but also lower infidelity. So as we, as, as we expect, uh, we, sh we go along this line. But it's, it's on par with, let's say, the, uh, the heuristics. Okay, but now I l I, we now let the agent control the time, and unfortunately, this would be a negative result now, it didn't beat the heuristic. But this is not the point here. I mean, I'm still happy about the result and I will show you why. Well, because let's look at this guy. How clever is this guy? What this guy is doing is first of all, tracking trajectories, good. So you don't see two lines because trajectories are lying on the real values of the noise. It applies one over sigma strategy. So just to say, uh, what does it mean? It controls time is just picking how long to estimate. So this tau time, this is what agent is picking. So he discovered one over sigma strategy. You see uh, that this is the how long it waits. And if sigma is small, it's just waiting longer. And if sigma is getting 
uh, higher, it's just waiting shorter. Uh, and finally, yeah, you can, you you can look uh, how the agent plays a game, so it flips this, but sometimes in order to keep uncertainty rather constant, sometimes it has to estimate, and basically in those six games we have two errors. Good, it plays somehow. But my favorite one is this guy. <laughs> so unfortunately not the, the best guy, it's my favorite one, but the most clever one. Why it's clever? Well, because it learned to flip only when the field was sufficiently large, so the black one was estimation, the red one successfully flipped. Also, it just, it, it, it learns when it's lost, so it's kind of trying to flip and then, okay, uh, something went wrong here, and you see that the real noise, the, perp, the, the, the orange is kind of getting lost with respect to, uh, to estimation, so the blue one is estimation, the orange is the real noise. Also, it correlates his uncertainty, so the sigma, with the error he's making. As an example of trajectory, so orange is the real noise, and in this part, he was not flipping enough, and basically he's of the real value. So he thinks the mu is something, but in reality, uh, the field he's estimating is far away. But he has this information because the shaded region is a sigma, he, he, he's assuming. And finally, he is using longer evolution time for small frequencies. And this makes sense, right? If, if my qubit is very slowly rotating, then I have to wait longer to see something, to see a contrast between zero and one. So he's, he's doing all of those things. And I'm happy, yes. The question is, and this is what we will do next, is just to look at all the strategy of this clever agent, or maybe even breed a more clever one, and try to learn from it, interpret the strategy, and apply it to maybe create a better heuristic, or uh, apply it to more complex algorithms like two qubit gates. Or maybe even use two agents. And I know Jan is using two, 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 two agents, so I will try to ask him for help. Good, and this brings us, brings us back to the coffee break, but then my summary. So we develop methods for fast and resource efficient estimation of the field. Uh, now we are wondering, can we generalize it behind the brown noise, but also deal with, ch with charge noise, for example? Mm, we, we use the agency to, to select whether we are doing the algorithm or estimation, and the agent was kind of adapting to the current knowledge, to the current state of the device, of the simulation in this case. Uh, the question is, can we do it on a real device, and can we extend to more complicated algorithms, and the next one in the queue would be two qubit gate. And finally, <laughs> we had the agent which was clever, we had the agent which was on the par with, heu with a heuristic, ex uh, I mean, with the heuristics, but can we combine, can we beat the heuristic with probably some super clever agent? This would be exactly it. So thank you very much for attention. No, this was not the slide. Thank you very much. Jan, for this nice talk, so questions. Okay, so let me ask myself, which I'm not an So what is the problem to generalize that for other types of noise? Okay, so the problem is uh, that the noises are just fast. So for example, there was this trajectory of the noise, which I can go back. Uh, so the brown, one, the brown one is just the slowest of them. And as I said, you can get rid of it by you know, doing isotopical purifications. It's an expensive process, but still. And what you are left with is the middle one, so the pink noise. It has a little bit of drift, but it has also a tail of high frequency noise. So even if I'm estimating oh, that my field is something, in reality, this moment after, it can just be off my estimation because it has a very non-negligible non -negligible amplitudes of high frequency noise. You cannot use the control then? You can control, but it's not going to be as efficient as here. And the proof of principle is this paper. And what they achieved with a relatively slow estimation is twofold uh, improvement of T2 star. So basically, this decay it improved from one microsecond to two. Alternative methods? 
There what is kind of noise? Because obviously the noise is quite often not white, but not brown, no? Yeah, so the thing which, is, uh, which we are discussing now is just to combining this method. So just once you get rid of low frequency noise, you effectively have a uncorrelated noise. So we can apply all of the methods for Markovian noise. So kind of, this would be just a method of creating high pass filter. So getting rid of the drift. Four o'clock with the coffee break, which is going to be 50 minutes, and we start at uh, four o'clock again here. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speakers.